satan, but there's a ha in front of it. And what that ha is, is a definite article. The Satan and the Satan standing, standing at his right hand to resist him. Okay, so the Satan. So it's not a proper name. It's the adversary is what it really should be translated as. Okay, everybody, we're going to start a new video now on Daniel chapter 10, which is very interesting. Uh, now, before we get into Daniel chapter 10, I think we should do a quick view, review on the previous video of Daniel chapter 9, so we can carry on the narrative. So in Daniel chapter 9, this video was called Chiasms in Daniel chapter 9. This was uh, just a previous video before this one. Okay, so this is the 70 weeks prophecy at the end of Daniel chapter 9. And we found that this here, this is the, the whole focus of the prophecy. The 70 weeks are decreed on your people and upon your holy city to end, tr end transgression, seal up sins, atone for iniquity, and the bringing in of everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and profit, and to anoint the holy of holies. That's the main, that's what, that's a summary of this whole prophecy. And now we'll find that in this prophecy, it says, it, it goes on quite a few times saying, you should know and comprehend. And now up here it says, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. I came to show you. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So there's several times where he keeps saying this, understand the matter, right? Know and comprehend from the going of the word. Uh, and now, so he's telling Daniel to, to understand this, know and comprehend this. And, then, and at the end of it, he talks about this uh, upon. So, so here comes the Messiah confirming a covenant for one week. In the middle of the week, he causes sacrifice and offering to rest or to cease, to end. Um, now, we know this is Jesus. He caused the, the sacrifice to end because he prophesied the uh, destruction of the second temple that ended the sacrifice and offering. And he also um, became the sacrifice to replace the temple sacrifices in Christian theology. And, and also there's this very disturbing line that is, as a result of what Jesus did, there will be a reaction to it. Upon the wing of abominations, there's a desolator will come. And until the end, what is decided, shall be the poured upon the desolator. So, and this is a war. Until the end of the war, desolations are decided upon. And the coming ruler of a people will destroy the city and the holy place. So that's Rome that destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem. So we talked about all this in the previous video. But this is a very, um, Daniel was told several times to understand this, and it's quite a bit to get your head around, especially for someone living in, uh, when was Daniel living? Uh, 586, 550. So, um, this, this particular part would, would, probably blew Daniel's mind, okay? Because he was looking, he was praying about the rebuilding of the holy city 
after the 70 years of desolation which had come up and and the 70 years was up so he was expecting the rebuilding of the holy city and this prophecy is talking about yes the holy city will be rebuilt but then it will be destroyed again and then there will be this desolator so it's a lot for Daniel to get his head around and think about and then this whole prophecy this prophecy was given in the first year of Darius uh, which which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans so this is um, Darius was the general from uh, Persia who conquered the city of Babylon so it looks like he was made ruler over the Babylonians probably under Cyrus is what I'm thinking we don't have a lot of history on Persia believe it or not it's really it's Iranian history there's not a lot of our archaeology in Iran um, especially anything to do with the Jews so this is why you know we don't know as much as we should know about Persia uh, all we know is really what was written by Herodotus a Greek historian <clears throat> so um, this is what Daniel was wrestling with is my point here so now if we go to the, uh, Daniel chapter 10 now in this one here I have the Hebrew up here and I just did a quick my own quick translation of it because I found that sometimes the translations that we just pick up like the King James or New International they're not always that accurate and and I think for studying Daniel especially we want to be very accurate and sometimes even in a good translation uh, things can be hidden that, that aren't clear in the English so I wanted to review the Hebrew to, to see if there's anything like that going on so we'll start with this the third year of Cyrus king of Persia so this is it could be two years after the previous vision because um, it was during the reign of Cyrus that Darius uh, conquered Babylon and that's when Daniel became a Persian um, slave or worker instead of a Babylonian slave or worker he was the chief uh, magician under the Babylonians and the Persians so anyway uh, the word is true and the army is great and he understood the word and to him was understanding of the vision so um, this is this is could be giving more understanding of the previous vision is what I'm getting to but we'll look into it at, into this vision and then we'll uh, determine from there in those days I Daniel was lamenting for three weeks of days now you notice this also re relates to the 70 week prophecy because the 70 weeks are weeks of years each week is seven years but he's saying this his his lament was for three weeks of days I ate no desirable bread which could also mean food and flesh or wine did not come into my mouth and I did not anoint myself at all until the fulfilling of the three weeks of days now anoint myself um, that's probably in his days is akin to bathing uh, ba uh, wiping yourself down with oil um, because they, they wouldn't have like uh, showers in those days or bathtubs and um, I know the native uh, people they they would uh, use smoke or cedar boughs uh, to disinfect their body it's a it's a form of bathing um, 
and then you bathe in water but not not every single day in the days that you're not doing that you, you're doing something like this probably okay so he didn't bathe is what he's saying he didn't eat didn't bathe for three weeks and in the 24th day of the first month I was by the side of the great river which is Hittical. So where is the Hittical River? Okay, here's a map of uh, Iraq. This is Iraq. Israel is over here. Uh, Jerusalem's right there. So here's uh, Kuwait is down here. So this is the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. Okay, and Babylon was right here. On right near the Euphrates River and the Hittical River is this river going up here through here and it goes through Susa this river here or it could be, or it could be this one it's one of these two that goes through Susa so Susa was a Persian capital because they had they had conquered Elam and then they conquered Babylon so they had several capital cities. Babylon was one. Susa was one. So when Daniel, when Babylon was uh, conquered, then Daniel was eventually moved to Susa because that would have been closer to the capital of Persia. So that he's on the Hittical River there. Okay, so he's on the river Hittical, by the side of the great river Hittical. And I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold, one man clothed in linen, whose loins were gir girded in the gold of Uphaz. Okay, so now Daniel, he'd been fasting for three full weeks, and he got, finally gets the vision on the 24th day of the first month. Now, if we calculate this by the Hebrew days, and if we look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 18, this is when they were in Egypt, um, about to leave Egypt under Moses. He says, In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your house. Leviticus chapter 23 verse 5 In the fourteenth day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So, so the fifteenth day of the first month is the Passover and then after that, there's seven days of unleavened bread, which would be uh, the 22nd day of the first month. It would be the end of the days of unleavened bread. So does this mean that Daniel fasted through the entire Passover and through the days of unleavened bread? Because remember, he's fasting. He's still thinking about the holy city and God's people. So I was lamenting three weeks of days. And on the 24th day, he started to have the vision. The 24th day of the first month. Well, that would mean that he started on the third day of the first month which carried right through the 15th day, right through the days of unleavened bread, which ended on the 21st day of the first month. Now, the only other explanation is if he's talking about Persian months and not talking about the Hebrew months. So that's a little bit unclear here, but it's an interesting side note. Um, now, is he fasting for the temple still. He's still fasting for the temple and for the Hebrew people, of course. And he's still pretty upset about the last vision that he had, about the temple being destroyed again, and 
the destroyer coming and the deceiver and all this stuff. Okay, so he's by the river Hittical and he says, I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold, one man clothed in linen. So clothed in linen, with his loins girded, that sort of is language suggesting the clothing of the high priest. And all the priests were, clo were clothed in white linen, and the high priest had a, a, gir a gold girdle type of thing. <clears throat> and his body was like Tarshish. Which I thought interesting. Now the English translations will say burl or onyx, uh, which is a yellow stone. Uh, but the actual Hebrew word right here, ke tarshish, like tarshish. So that must be a stone that comes from tarshish. And um, tarshish in the book of Jonah, that's where Jonah ran to when he was running from God. He, he took a ship that was going to Tarshish. And some say uh, that it was in Spain. So, just an interesting note there. So his body was like Tarshish, like a, like a yellow precious stone. And his face was like the appearance of lightning. And his eyes like the torches of fire. And his arms... and feet like the look of polished brass, and the sound of his words like the sound of a crowd. So this is very interesting language. Because if we look at Revelation chapter 1, um, John's vision, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the cam seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Or Daniel said the sound of a multitude. Well, many waters could also be like a multitude. If we go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings. So the great multitude and the mighty many waters is the same thing. So we look back at Daniel again, one man clothed in linen, so up here it would be Ish one, so that's man one, one man. Um, Bosch clothed Badim in linen. So Ish the word ish in Hebrew is used for husband or man. Um, isha is wife or woman. So the Hebrews didn't have a separate word for wife or husband. They would use language like my woman, your woman, his woman, uh, or, or my man, her man, your man. They would they wouldn't they didn't have a different word for husband or wife. So it was man or woman is the basic meaning of this word ish. This is important for for later verses as we'll see. So what he's seeing is and behold one man clothed in linen. And and then he had this uh, loins girded in gold. Abu Faz, and his body like onyx, and his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like the torches of fire, his arms and feet like the look of polished brass, 
and the sounds of his word like the sound of a crowd or like what this says literally the sound of his word like the sound of the many so like a crowd so it's the same thing as many waters so it's the same person basically or the same uniform as uh, John sees in the Revelation now in John's Revelation this person is identified as Jesus Christ in, among the seven lampstands um, in Daniel he's not identified so this is uh, who this is okay <clears throat> and I Daniel saw the vision alone and the men that were with me did not see the vision rather a, gr a great quaking fell upon them and they fled and hid themselves well this language also reminds us of Revelation in Revelation chapter 6 15 and 16 and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand so this really reminds us this Daniel chapter 10 really brings this forward where we will, we will see that uh, Daniel's friends fled and hid themselves and a great quaking fell upon them and, and I was left alone and I saw this great vision and there was left in me no strength and my honor in me was turned to ruin that means like I I had no uh, no courage left no no confidence left and I retained no strength and I heard the sound of his words and when I heard the sound of his words I was in a deep sleep on my face and my face was on the earth so who shall be able to stand right though, though the other guys fled and hid in the rocks and even Daniel can't stand and he a uh, behold a hand touched me and I shook upon my hands and knees and he said to me, Daniel, a desirable man, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, because now I am sent to you. And when he had spoken with me this word, I stood trembling. So even now he's still trembling because of this fiery eyes and, and golden girdle and this whole being is like superhuman being that is like a man so it's in the shape of a man but with all these attributes that make it superhuman and he said you should not fear Daniel because from the first day you gave your heart to understand so at the beginning of the three full weeks the 21 days and to humble humble yourself before your God your words were heard and I have come by your words so because of your prayers because then then this is why I came so don't fear I'm here to teach you I'm not here to harm you but a chief now they say a prince in some translations I think a prince is kind of misleading um, that sort of says royal family and heir to be king and things like that this is not that um, this uh, word is right here shar sar a sar and it's used um, for officials it's used for leaders it's used for maybe the like in the time of the judges or a leader of a family even or chief of a tribe 
so it's a, it's just a leader. It's it's just a a, a chief. So I, I translated it as chief. He's a he's he's a chief, but he's not necessarily the top chief. He's a chief in an assembly of chiefs, and there may be a chief of the chiefs. So it's really unclear. Like it's just a you know in a ruling position of some kind. So, but a chief from the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So that's the 21 days Daniel was fasting, right? And behold, Michael, one of the head chiefs, you see, so there's head chiefs and lower chiefs. So Michael is a head chief and the kingdom of the chief from the kingdom of Persia is a lower chief. So this being, I'll, I'll call him Yeshua, uh, because of Revelation, he came to help Daniel, but the chief angel, we'll say, from the kingdom of Persia, withstood him, who said, you can't come here. So he's in charge of Persia. So he said, stopping him from coming. So he had to call the head chief, Michael, to come and overrule this guy, right? So Michael, one of the head chiefs, came to help me, and I was left there beside the kings of Persia. So Yeshua there is uh, perhaps uh, protecting the kings of Persia, or, or as Michael goes to do something, He's there guarding Persia, or something's going on here. Now, if you enjoy these videos, uh, please like and share and subscribe um, to help out the algorithm and to help spread this video out for others to see. Thank you very much. Now, I came to teach you what will encounter your people in the latter of the days, because the vision is yet for days. So this is why he's here. Um, to tell Daniel what will encounter his people. Now, in the latter of the days, now this is still talking about the, the, the 70 weeks vision. Because that was about the temple being destroyed again, the Romans destroying the temple, and the desolator coming. So I think he's coming to tell them, okay, this we're going to give you more information now to help you to understand this, give you better understanding. Because if we remember back in the beginning, I think he's talking about after this vision, this would be in chapter 10, 11, and 12, that he's saying, okay, the word is true, the army is great, these chiefs and this army, right? And he understood the word, and to him was understanding of the vision. So the understanding of the whole thing is still being built upon all the way through the, to the end of Daniel. So I came because the vision is for yet for days. And when he had spoken these words with me, I set my face to the earth, and I became bound, tongue-tied. It means tongue-tied, speechless. Um, that is what this word means. Elam. Elam. It means bound, to bind. And, and what that means is if you're in a debate with somebody, and you leave them speechless, you bound them. You won the debate. Um, you, 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 they have no answer. They have nothing to say, and nothing more to say. You have overcome them in your teachings. That's the, the, the basic meaning of bound. For those of you who like to talk about loosed and bound, there's bound. Okay, so we're gonna before we get to this, and we're gonna take a quick look at Michael. Who is Michael? 
Okay? There's a few other scriptures about Michael that are very interesting. Jude, chapter 1, verse 9. Jude was the brother of Jesus, one of the apostles. So Jude says, Yet Michael, the archangel, so the chief of the angels, right? The archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So where was this recorded? Where is this recorded? I think this here might be a mistranslation in the Greek. It's possible. But we'll see. Because the only place I can find that is anywhere near explaining this is way back in the Hebrew Scriptures, Zechariah chapter 3. And he showed me Yeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. This is an important phrase right here. Not, not angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. Okay? So the angel of the Lord is a, is a figure. This is a, a specific angel of the Lord that appears in certain times in Scripture. Um, the angel of the Lord is the one who stopped Abraham from uh, sacrificing Isaac. The angel of the Lord called out and said, Abraham, do not harm the child. Um, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua, Yeshua, as he, right after he conquered uh, uh, Jericho. He was going in to conquer the, the promised land. And then the angel of the Lord stood with his sword held high, and Joshua said, Are you a friend or a foe? And he said, I am the captain of the Lord's host. So that's the angel of the Lord. Um, this, this figure appears in several times in Hebrew Scriptures. So here he is again, the angel of the Lord. And he showed me Yeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan, standing at his right hand to resist him. So now here we have to get into the Hebrew again because this is a bit misleading. So let's take a look. Back to my trusty blue letter Bible. So we go here, find Zechariah, there it is, Zech. Chapter 3. Okay, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Okay. Now we click on that, tools, and it gives us the Hebrew. So, and he showed me Yeshua, the great priest, or the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, Yahweh. And this is important. There's Satan, Satan, but there's a Ha in front of it. And what that Ha is, is a definite article. The Satan and the Satan. Standing, standing at his right hand to resist him. Okay, so the Satan. So it's not a proper name. It's the adversary is what it really should be translated as. So, and the adversary standing at his right hand to resist him. Okay, and then it says, okay. And Yahweh said to the adversary, or Satan, the adversary, Yahweh rebukes you. 
the adversary. Or that could be, now if this is ha, used in front of a proper name, it could be O Satan, like they translated here. But the other ones don't really fit. Uh, they're, they're not going to say the Lord said to O Satan. But it could be used here as a name. Is the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. But since it's been used other places here with the same definite article, I would translate it as he's still, he's nameless. He's still nameless. He's saying, the Lord rebuke you, the adversary. The Lord will rebuke you, O the adversary that has chosen Jerusalem. And is this not a brand, a brand plucked from the fire? So this is the only place where Michael, the archangel, would be the angel of the Lord, right? And when that's where he appears here is uh, he showed me Yeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh. And so when this archangel speaks, he's speaking the words of Yahweh. Yahweh rebuke you. You see, because it's not like there's more than one God. The, 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 the archangel is not God, but he is a representative. He's like an ambassador for God. God sent him, and they have a connection. Like, like we have a connection with God. Could you imagine what kind of connection the archangel has with God? So God can speak through him. So I think that's what's happening here. And... It's not, it's not like saying many gods. God, God is in charge of his whole kingdom. And everyone in the kingdom is doing God's will. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels. Okay, are, there, are they Michael's angels or God's angels? They're God's angels. But Michael is the chief of the angels. He's the he's the uh, the angel of the Lord. Okay, so Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon is the adversary, and the dragon fought and his angels. So the dragon had convinced a certain number of the angels to rebel against God. So there was a war in heaven, and the dragon prevailed not, and there was no place found any more in heaven. It, this has to do with the work that was done by Jesus Christ. Is that he what what he did? It was the it was the adversary who killed Jesus. He he uh, he caused the um, the priests and and the the rulers and everyone to go against Jesus. So he was behind all that. So it was the, in in reality, the adversary was the chief orchestrator of the crucifixion of Christ. And do, and in doing that, there was no place found anymore because he had killed the Son of God. And the dra great dragon was cast out of heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now in the Greek, we'll see that in, in the Hebrew, this is not personified. This old, this, the adversary. But we find in the Hebrew, in the Greek language, these become personified because when you translate it from the Hebrew into a, a language like Greek, Greek has um, all their Greek mythology. And so when they start translating a, a, a spiritual book, their mythology, the language of their mythology creeps into it. So this is, uh, this is the Greek mythology. You'll, you'll also find like Shoal gets translated as Hades. 
Well, Hades is, you know, when you cross the river Styx and you enter into the land of the dead. That's Greek mythology. But the, the Hebrew Bible doesn't talk anything like that ab about the place of the dead. In the Greek language, it's called Sheol, and it's more of a, a place of uh, forgetfulness. It's a, it's a place of endlessness or like if you look you'll see uh, Jonah when he fell into the when he was cast into the ocean and he went down 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 in the whale down deeper and deeper and deeper he went down to shore at the roots of the mountains the deepest deep and then that's when he prayed to the almighty god and then the the whale um, or the great fish spit him out on dry land again. So it's like there's no crossing the river Styx. There's no guards. There's no ferryman. That's all Greek mythology. So you'll see this language get kind of a little skewed in when it's translated into Greek. Okay? So anyway, the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come the salvation because of Christ, and strength in the kingdom of our God. So the kingdom of God became stronger, and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down. The brethren were the angels, but now the brethren are on earth. Right? which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So this is now it's the Christian's fight with the, with the dragon, because he's on earth. So he's going to be cast down from the earth next, right, at the second coming of Christ. So... This uh, Michael, this also shows us Michael. That he's the archangel. He's the, the general of the angels in, in battle. Okay? So let's get back to Daniel chapter 10. Okay, and when he had spoken these words with me, I set my face to the earth and I became bound, or tongue-tied. And behold, this is an interesting part here. Because remember I told you about the one man would be the Ish Ahad. Well, now he's using a different, he's using a different description now. He's saying right here. Kidmut would be as the, the, this is a um, prefix, the kaf prefix, which means just as or like the likeness as a son of Adam. So here it is. Behold one as the likeness of the sons of mankind. Now Adam it can be a proper noun. Or it can be speaking of mankind. It's used in both ways. So sons of Adam, because we are all sons of Adam, right? So now this this guy no longer has the fiery eyes and the golden girl and all this stuff. He looks like a man. He's, he's closer to Daniel and he's be, being more personal now. And maybe he is... Uh, changed his appearance to, to look like a more like a son of Adam, like a man, um, to make Daniel more comfortable. And it's also like a, a preview of Christ, that Christ, um, even though he has the eyes of fiery flames and talking like many waters, he's also a son of man, right? So behold, one is the likeness of the sons of mankind. Touch my lips. And I opened my mouth and spoke. And I said to him that stood before me, Lord, Adonai, he's using, uh, Lord, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I retain no strength. 
For how can a servant such as this of my Lord talk with my Lord like this? And I had no strength in me to stand. Right? Who is able to stand? Not even Daniel. And no breath that was in me. And again, one like the appearance of a man. Now he's not saying the sons of man. He's just saying the appearance of a man. Touch me. And he strengthened me. And he said, Do not fear, desirable man. Peace to you. Be very strong. Shalom. Peace, right? Be very strong. And when he had spoken with me, I was strengthened. And I said, Let my Lord speak, because you have strengthened me. And he said, Do you know, do you know why I have come to you? Because he'd already told them why he came back here. He said, see, here it is in verse 14. Now I came to teach you what will encounter your people in the latter of the days, because the vision is yet for days. Now back in verse 20, or way later in verse 20, he's saying, Do you know why I have come to you? And now I will return to battle with the chief of Persia, and I am going, and behold, the chief of Greece is coming. So there's another, there's angels on earth are battling over these cities and over these nations, right? And Greece came, and what did Greece do when they conquered? They Hellenized everything, right? So is that good or is that not good for the kingdom of God? to Hellenize the Jews, Hellenize the entire known world of, of this Bible. Um, all of per, all of the uh, Egypt and the Levant and uh, Greece was all Hellenized and parts of Persia also. Okay, nevertheless, so here's the battle is still happening and I got to get back there. Nevertheless, I will show you the writing in the scroll of truth, in the book of truth. And not one is supporting me in these things. So nobody else is in on this except Michael, the chief of you people. So who's you people? He doesn't say chief of Israel or, or chief of um, the Hebrews is right here. Sar Kem. Kem is a suffix. It just means you, masculine plural. Chief of you, masculine plural. So I translated that as chief of you people. Because in the Hebrew, masculine is inclusive. Like if it's a feminine, it, it's only talking about females. But if it's masculine, it's talking about everybody. So masculine is an inclusive and feminine is exclusive. So he's just saying chief of you people. Now who is this chief of you people? Like given what the prophecy is about, about Yeshua, is he talking about the nation of Israel at that time? Or is he talking about the Hebrews? Or is he talking about believers? Because at this time the Hebrews, the Hebrews are all in Babylon, in captivity. Now they're in Persia. They, they have not yet been directed by Cyrus to go back to rebuild Jerusalem. This hasn't happened yet. Um, so uh, and and when that did happen, when Cyrus, the king of Persia, allowed the Jews to return, only a small number of them returned. Uh, most of them stayed in Babylon because they had a life there. They had family there. They had lived there for 70 years. There was the next generation. It was two generations. Um... So most of them stayed. So who is you people? You know, like, 
I think it's talking more about God's people because even if you look all through the Hebrew Bible in ancient Israel, um, it was constantly, there were very few times when all of the people were on, were, were following God and, and doing God's ways. Most of the time, um, a good number of them were in rebellion against God. And it was always like a prophet would be sent or a leader would be sent to bring them back. Um, and finally, God had the city destroyed and sent them off into captivity. Um, and then he brought back, he ordered them all back. And like a small number of them came back, actually came. So who was you people is a big question. But we'll maybe answer that in verse 11. That'll be for the next video. So that brings us to the end of this video. That's a pretty good deep dive into Daniel chapter 10. And it's very important to dig into some of this stuff because chapter 11 gets really complicated and 12 is even more. So we'll see if we can dig into this. Um, as deep as we possibly can and uh, I think it'll be very revealing so um, don't forget to like share and subscribe to support the channel and uh, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next video